in various branches of mathematics, a useful construction is often viewed as the most efficient solution to a certain problem. The definition of a universal property uses the language of category theory to make this notion precise and to study it abstractly. This article gives a general treatment of universal properties. To understand the concept, it is useful to study several examples first, of which there are many. All three objects, direct product and direct sum, free group, free lattice, graph and group, Dedekind McNeil completion, product topology, stone check compactification, tensor product, inverse limit and direct limit, kernel and co-kernel, pullback, push out and equalizer, motivation. Before giving a formal definition of universal properties, we offer some motivation for studying such constructions. The concrete details of a given construction may be messy, but if the construction satisfies a universal property, one can forget all those details. All there is to know about the construct is already contained in the universal property. Proofs often become short and elegant if the universal property is used rather than the concrete details. For example, the tensor algebra of a vector space is slightly painful to actually construct, but using its universal property makes it much easier to deal with. Universal properties define objects uniquely up to a unique isomorphism. Therefore, one strategy to prove that two objects are isomorphic is to show that they satisfy the same universal property. Universal constructions are functorial in nature. If one can carry out the construction for every object in a category C then one obtains a functor on C. Furthermore, this functor is a right or left adjoint to the functor U used in the definition of the universal property. Universal properties occur everywhere in mathematics. By understanding their abstract properties, one obtains information about all these constructions and can avoid repeating the same analysis for each individual instance. Formal definition. Suppose that U, DC is a functor from a category D to a category C, and let X be an object of C. Consider the following dual notions. An initial morphism from X to U is an initial object in the category of morphisms from X to U. In other words, it consists of a pair where A is an object of D and Phi. X U is a morphism in C, such that the following initial property is satisfied. Whenever Y is an object of D and F, X U is a morphism in C, then there exists a unique morphism G, a Y such that the following diagram commutes. A terminal morphism from U to X is a terminal object in the comma category of morphisms from U to X. In other words, it consists of a pair where A is an object of D in Phi. UX is a morphism in C, such that the following terminal property is satisfied. Whenever Y is an object of D and F, UX is a morphism in C, then there exists a unique morphism G, YA such that the following diagram commutes. The term universal morphism refers either to an initial morphism or a terminal morphism, and the term universal property refers either to an initial property or a terminal property. In each definition, the existence of the morphism G intuitively expresses the fact that is general enough while the uniqueness of the morphism ensures that is not too general. Duality. Since the notions of initial and terminal are dual, it is often enough to discuss only one of them, and simply reverse arrows in C for the dual discussion. Alternatively, the word universal is often used in place of both words. Note. Some authors may call only one of these constructions a universal morphism and the other one a co-universal morphism, which is which depends on the author. Although in order to be consistent with the naming of limits and co-limits the latter construction should be named universal and the former, co-universal. This article uses the unambiguous terminology of initial and terminal objects. Examples 
Below are a few examples. To highlight the general idea, the reader can construct numerous other examples by consulting the articles mentioned in the introduction. Tensor algebras let C be the category of vector spaces K V E C T over a field K and let D be the category of algebras K A L G over K. Let U. K A L G K V E C T be the forgetful functor which assigns to each algebra its underlying vector space. Given any vector space V over K we can construct the tensor algebra T of V. The tensor algebra is characterized by the fact any linear map from V to an algebra A can be uniquely extended to an algebra homomorphism from T to A. This statement is an initial property of the tensor algebra since it expresses the fact that the pair I, where I, VT is the inclusion map, is an initial morphism from the vector space V to the functor U. Since this construction works for any vector space V, we conclude that T is a functor from KVECT to KALG. This means that T is left adjoint to the forgetful functor U. Products A categorical products can be characterized by a terminal property. For concreteness one may consider the Cartesian product in set, the direct products in GRP, or the product topology in top, where products exist. Let X and Y be objects of a category D. The product of X and Y is an object X times Y together with two morphisms pi 1, X times Y X pi 2, X times Y Y such that for any other object Z of D and morphisms F, Z X and G, Z Y there exists a unique morphism H. Zx times y such that f equals pi 1 h and g equals pi 2 h. To understand this characterization as a terminal property we take the category C to be the product category D times D and define the diagonal functor, delta, dd times d by delta equals and delta equals, then, is a terminal morphism from delta to the object of d times d. If is any morphism from 2, then it must equal a morphism delta equals from delta equals to delta equals, followed by limits and colimits. Categorical products are a particular kind of limiting category theory. One can generalize the above example to arbitrary limits and colimits. Let J and C be categories with J a small index category and let C J be the corresponding functor category. The diagonal functor delta C C J is the functor that maps each object n in C to the constant functor delta J C to n equals n for each x in J. Given a functor f, j c, the limit of f, if it exists, is nothing but a terminal morphism from delta to f. Duly, the colimit of f is an initial morphism from f to delta. Properties Existence and uniqueness defining a quantity does not guarantee its existence. Given a functor u and an object x is above, there may or may not exist an initial morphism from x to u. If, however, an initial morphism does exist then it is essentially unique. Specifically, it is unique up to a unique isomorphism. If is another such pair, then there exists a unique isomorphism k. A such that phi equals u phi. This is easily seen by substituting for in the definition of the initial property. It is the pair which is essentially unique in this fashion. The object A itself is only unique up to isomorphism. Indeed, if is an initial morphism and K A is any isomorphism then the pair where phi equals u phi is also an initial morphism. Equivalent formulations The definition of a universal morphism can be rephrased in a variety of ways. Let U be a functor from D to C, and let X be an object of C. Then the following statements are equivalent. Is an initial morphism from X to U. Is an initial object of the comma category. Is a representation of HMC. The dual statements are also equivalent. Is a terminal morphism from U to X. Is a terminal object of the comma category is a representation of HMC. Relation to adjoint functors supposes an initial morphism from X1 to U and is an initial morphism from X2 to U. 
by the initial property, given any morphism H. X1 X2 there exists a unique morphism G. A1 A2 such that the following diagram commutes. If every object C of C admits an initial morphism to U, then the assignment and defines a func to V from C to D. The maps phi I then define a natural transformation from 1 C to U V. The functors are then a pair of adjoint functors, with V left adjoint to U and U right adjoint to V. Similar statements apply to the dual situation of terminal morphisms from U. If such morphisms exist for every X in C1 obtains a func to V. CD which is right adjoint to U. Indeed, all pairs of adjoint functors arise from universal constructions in this manner. Let F and G be a pair of adjoint functors with unit eta and co-unit epsilon. Then we have a universal morphism for each object in C and D. For each object x in C, eta x is an initial morphism from x to g, that is, for all f, x g there exists a unique g, f y for which the following diagrams commute. For each object y and d, epsilon y is a terminal morphism from f to y, that is, for all g, f y there exists a unique f, x g for which the following diagrams commute. Universal constructions are more general than adjoint functor pairs. A universal construction is like an optimization problem. It gives rise to an adjoint pair if and only if this problem has a solution for every object of C. History Universal properties of various topological constructions were presented by Pierre Samuel in 1948. They were later used extensively by Bourbaki. The closely related concept of adjoint functors was introduced independently by Daniel Kahn in 1958.